Hi, everybody. This is Samantha Wolf from the law offices of Samantha Wolf. We're located at 20 East 6th Street in Suite 206 in Waynesboro, Pennsylvania. And I'm excited today because we're doing our next installment of Partnering with the Pros. And today I have the honor of welcoming Michael Lynch to our Partnering with the Pros. Welcome, Michael. Thanks for being here today. We appreciate it. Thanks for having um, me. Yes, absolutely. We're excited to have a financial advisor and be able to pick your brain about some things. So let me tell you a little bit about Michael so we have some background about it. But um, we will post this video on our YouTube and then across our social media platforms. And we hope that this is helpful to clients and referral sources alike. So with that being said, let me jump in and tell you a little bit about our latest partnering with the pro. So Michael Lynch is a certified financial planner and he's a partner at Lynch Investment Planning. The firm was founded by his father in 1990 and is a completely independent registered investment advisor that helps families navigate financial decision points. And one of the things I wanted to highlight about Michael's biography is that he joined Lynch Investment Planning after spending over seven years as an active duty army officer. He held various positions in the army, including an Apache helicopter pilot, an aviation company commander, a human resources director, and a recruiting commander. He also had combat deployment in Afghanistan and led a national level strategic aviation operation in South Korea. And I wanted to highlight that because very rarely do we meet with financial advisors that have such an extensive backgrounds like that. And I feel like that's helpful for our clients to know. Another important thing to know about Michael is he has his master's degree in finance, and he chose to enter the financial planning profession to continue a vocation of service to families and their financial needs. So he earned his master's degree in finance from St. Joseph's University and received his undergraduate degree from the University of Delaware, where he earned membership in, and tell me if I'm saying this right, is it uh, five Beta Kappa Honor Society. Am I saying that right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. And he lives in Newtown Square, Pennsylvania with his wife and four sons. In his spare time, he enjoys fitness, reading up on tax law changes, which I have an affinity for as well. Who doesn't? <laughs> uh, exactly. Who doesn't want to read that? Yes. And he's also involved in his church and community. He serves as a board member and volunteers for multiple nonprofit organizations. And he continues his service to the country as a major in the Army Reserve. So thank you for being here, Michael. Thank you for your service. And thanks for sharing your time with us as we kind of pick your brain and ask some questions about the financial planning field. Are you ready to dive in? Can't wait. Okay. So we're going to start off because when we meet with clients, a lot of times clients may not understand what is a financial advisor? Why is a financial advisor so important? At our office here, we really think it's important to have a good team for our clients. And that includes a good financial advisor and a good accountant, as well as an attorney. So tell us what, Michael, what is the point of a financial advisor? The, the, the biggest value that we add to clients is an objective counselor. The uh, like like you said, the the attorney, the sort of the CPA and the uh, financial planner are all different fingers on the same hand. Yeah. Um, and, and collectively, we support that client and that family navigate their their business, their retirement, all of the financial decisions that they have. And um, the a lot of people. A lot of people look at financial planners as, as just someone where they can drop off some money and, and right. go give a check to it. something like that. Right. Right. Um, and that's that's not that's that's what pays the bills and that's what keeps us, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in a relationship. But that's not how we operate. Uh, mm -hmm. We we prefer to operate as as a client's personal CFO. Um, okay. If they have questions about Social Security planning or Medicare or what's happening with interest rates why is peanut butter eight dollars a jar um that's that's the that's the advice and that's the counsel that we can bring to the table um you know in, in unison and, and in concert with the other professionals that the client mm -hmm. has 
So the goal, and I'm just speaking because I know from my standpoint, the goal is that you want to be creating these relationships with your clients where they can look to you not only for, hey, here's my money that I want to invest, but they can also rely on you as a resource as they're navigating life, whether it be through the aging process, maybe they have kids going to school. And mm -hmm. so I wanted to make sure that we focused on that because here in our office, it's all about the relationships and mm -hmm. making sure that we're helping clients get where they need to be through the estate planning process. And I kind of think that you do that as a mirror only on the financial planning side of things. Yeah. Uh, one of the skill sets that we don't have is, is how do we structure some, some complex uh, estate transfer strategies, right? That's, that's right. why, that's why we partner mm -hmm. and we work uh, closely with our, with our friends in the, uh, in the legal field. Uh, but the way, the way we operate, and we're we're involved in different organizations that that focus and do um, you know continuing education on on estate planning and tax issues, mm -hmm. uh, which is how we met. But yeah. um, our, our focus is is on the client and the client's mm -hmm. family. Mm -hmm. um, if if it's a um, if there's other other parties involved, um, then that's usually the 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 attorney's job to sort of be the funnel for all of that mm -hmm. information, all that communication. And, and we like to think of ourselves as, as the, the cheerleader for the client and the client's mm -hmm. family, right? Um, for instance, we, we were dealing with a case where a client uh, chose to have a liquidation event for his business into an ESOP. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you can imagine, I'm sure you've been a part of those types of things where there are, there's a lot of people at the table Mm -hmm. um, and, the, and the estate planner and, and counsel, um, they're sort of the CEO at the table. Mm -hmm. And and we saw our jobs as, as again, having a long-term relationship previously with the client and their family to to sort of be that bodyguard for that client and that family. Because uh, there's business interests, there's, you know, equity groups, there's all kinds mm -hmm. of different people at the table. Um, but yeah, we, we focus, you know, our, our bullseyes on the client and their family. Mm -hmm. And I do think, tell me if you agree with this, I think that when you have multiple people coming to the table for the best interest of the client, in my experience, usually you end up with the best financial plan, the best legal plan, and the best tax structure. Like It's just always, I think, very beneficial to a, the client to have all of those people involved. And I think that it's really important when we're partnering with, especially financial advisors, to get them involved in the process as early as we can. So I understand that your kind of wheelhouse isn't necessarily the legal parts of it, mm -hmm. but I feel like when I'm counseling clients, for example, yesterday we were talking about kind of refocusing when this individual has to pay bills because we're lo looking at long-term care planning and protection and just knowing where should we pull the money from first as a as a priority what money do we want to try to preserve and there's some financial components there's some tax components to it and so it's really helpful to either have the financial advisor advisor on the phone or they're in person because they're going to think of things when I'm kind of focused on the legal aspect of it, they're going to be able to tell me what are the investment options, what makes the most sense for payouts. And sometimes we do some trust where we're transferring things to trust. And I always appreciate the financial advisor saying, well, you know, if we transfer it to a trust, it might change how the annuity pays out or there might be some riders that we lose. So what has been your experience working with attorneys as far as the collaborative effort well you you started off by saying that the client usually has the best result hands down when when advisors uh, financial planners and attorneys and cpas all work together mm -hmm. um there's we all bring something different to the table right mm -hmm. um and, it, and it's all about enabling the client to make the most informed decision because yes. ultimately you know we advise um, and they might, we might, we might be a conflict. There, there have been times where, um, with with tax attorneys, uh, we've we've disagreed on whether to pull money out uh, and and draw taxable income forward as as a tax planning technique, which isn't necessarily going to make the most tax sense now. Um, but we can we can argue those pros and cons mm -hmm. 
on behalf of the client to the client so that he or she can make that informed decision and make a choice. Um, so it's, it's, it's great to have those differences of, mm -hmm. uh, of, of experience. And I think that when you have all of those partners, all of those trusted advisors coming to the table and when everybody is in agreement, so when your attorney, when your financial advisor, or when your accountant are all saying, yes, this is how we should proceed, then I feel like you can have the confidence to walk forward with that plan and be able to execute that. And I think it gives the client the best peace of mind as far as that goes. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about how do I pick a financial advisor? So let me kind of talk a little bit about from the legal perspective, because what I always tell clients is the example I give them is that it's a lot like, for the lack of better example, it's a lot like dating in the sense that you do have the option to talk to different attorneys and figure out who makes you feel comfortable, who addresses the needs that you have. And so when I have a client who comes in and say, says, you know, I don't want a financial advisor, or maybe they've had a bad experience with a financial advisor, I always encourage them, well, let's interview, for lack of a better word, other advisors and see if maybe it's a better match. And so I'm interested in what your opinion is about how do you pick a financial advisor? Find one that you trust. Mm -hmm. um, competence is an expectation and the, the key words to look for are fiduciary and in my, of course I'm biased, but a certified financial planner is, is the minimum barrier to entry. If you're okay. not, if you're not a certified financial planner and you have some other, and there's, there's designations, you know, alphabet soup out there. Mm -hmm. Um, but the, the CFPs are the ones who really, really enforce the fiduciary standard, uh, okay. which, uh, you know, the SEC can't really even get their hands on what, what best interest means. Uh, but the CFP has been doing that since, you know, my dad became one in the, you know, early nineties. So um, when we're talking but, about a CFP, Michael, that means like there are certain requirements to get that designation, correct? Yes. Um, okay. so it, it's an advanced credential that, you know, there's education requirements, experience requirements, and ethics requirements, and then continuing ethics, continuing education. Um, I'm, I'm sure very similar to what you do at the bar. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so pick one that that is trustworthy. Um, ask how they get paid. Mm -hmm. I think transparency in pricing is. I don't know why it's not as transparent as it is, but right. just, and if they can't explain it, then dig a little deeper. You know. Mm -hmm. Right. So do you volunteer that information? Like, will you say in an initial meeting with an individual, will you say, this is how I get paid and lay it all out for them? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's well, I mean, we do that. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So uh, we're looking for, so at minimum, we want the credentials CFP to be after the name as far as yes. credentialing. And then once you find that, it's just a question of, when you talk to this individual, do you trust them? Do you get a sense that they are going to be for your best interest yeah. and helping you figure out the best way to move forward as far as investments? Is that a yeah, fair summary? I, th I think that's fair. Communication and responsiveness is also one that, um, again, if, if we're going to have a relationship and be on the same team together, you should be able to call me and I'll answer the phone, right? If you have right. to call 1-800-whatever, um, then how intimate really is that relationship going to be? So, Absolutely. you know, and, and it just, just like, just like you are as an attorney. And, and one of the things that kind of connected me with, with, uh, when we first met was just your, your knowledge of the material, right? So their mm -hmm. competency is, like I said, it's, it's an expectation. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's, it's most noticeable when it's not there. Um, right. but when you, when you have someone with a, um, sort of, a an outward abundance of competence uh, or experience in any given category, then, then, sure. If they if they check all the other blocks, then then go for it. Yeah. No, I, I think you're absolutely right, and I do agree with what you're saying. Like, it should be expected that your advisor is competent. Right. You know, that should be something that you should expect from those individuals. Mm -hmm. So, what makes you unique as a financial advisor as opposed to any other financial advisor a client could meet with? I'd say the size of our firm. We we have a manageable uh, book of business. We're mm -hmm. not overextending. We're, my clients 
call and text all the time. And, it, you know, again, you're not calling some call center. Um, right. I, I prefer if, if I didn't have something tonight, I probably would have driven out to Adams County to do this face to face because I really value that <laughs> connection. Um, I, I really value just actually being in someone's presence to, to be able to, to advise them. Um, you know, my, my loyalty also to my clients is something that I think sadly makes me, new, you know, unique, but, uh, other advisors are, are loyal, but again, I'm protective in a somewhat bear like way for my clients and I won't let anything bad happen to them. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, two things I wanted to point out, which is the first, which might be obvious for anyone who's watching the video, but one of the things that I feel like can be really helpful for aging clients is that they may want a financial advisor who is younger than them, because that means that as they age, that person most likely will be there. And then as it goes to the next generation, kids, grandkids, you have somebody who's kind of steering the ship. So I think that's important. And I think that nowadays, more and more, I'm seeing clients appreciate that, having somebody who's going to follow and be able to follow it through all the way to what they wanted. So I wanted to mention that. And then mm -hmm. secondly, I think that you're right in the sense that being able to make the connection. So I do want to kind of give a little backstory about how I met Michael. So um, an attorney that practices in Delaware County had invited me to come speak to the Delaware County Estate Planning Council. That's what it's yeah. called, right, Michael? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, and they wanted me to talk about the SECURE Act which for those of you who are listening, is the act that Trump signed into law at the end of 2019 that dealt with changes in retirement plans. The big change was that it changed it so that you couldn't stretch out as a beneficiary the distributions for a retirement account. Instead, for most people, you had to take it within a 10-year period. So I'm down there kind of talking. And note that when I'm talking about this topic, as interesting as I try to make it, it's a very technical discussion. And one of the things I appreciated is when I would look out on the audience and I could find somebody that I thought was listening or maybe pretending to listen or maybe actually listening. And you were sitting kind of in the one corner and you would be nodding your head or, you know, making eye contact, like you weren't sleeping in the corner, which I really appreciated. Like you were very engaged in that. And I think that that speaks to, I know we kind of mentioned it a little bit in your biography, but I feel like you enjoy the tax aspect of your job. Is that true? I'm a junkie. Um, maybe it's just an army experience being a, you know, going through regulations and doctrine and all that stuff. But to me, it's a puzzle. Um, yes. I like math. I like taxes. I love, you know, nobody, nobody should um, avoid taxes. Uh, right. But there's no reason to pay more than one ought to in any yes. given circumstance. So. Absolutely. And when it comes to a financial advisor, although you don't have to have a financial advisor that is versed in tax planning, what we've learned with the changes to under the SECURE Act to retirement is that it is very helpful to have a financial planner who has an interest in following what's happening. Because when a major law change kind of comes in and sweeps in all of these changes, you do need a financial advisor who's going to be able to say, you know what, we designated some beneficiaries on that retirement plan and we should probably review them to make sure mm -hmm. under the new law that this is still gonna work. And so I feel like ha partnering and having a financial advisor who has an interest in tax planning can be very helpful to clients. Absolutely. I, I, I like to tell people, I, I want to know just enough to, you know, just enough to be dangerous, but also know my limits, right? I'm not yeah. a practicing CPA, nor am I an attorney. Uh, but when something changes come down mm -hmm. like that, like you said, it, it sort of triggers that, okay, um, Mr. Smith, maybe you should talk to Samantha about yeah. where the trust that that's placed in as a better. So um, it, it's important to stay current. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. So you have somebody who says, I'd really like to have a financial advisor. What attributes, and I know that this kind of blends in with what we were just talking about, what attributes should someone be looking for in a financial advisor? Someone who's, I, I, I like to, it might sound corny, but um, someone who's authentic, mm -hmm. right? I'm not trying to be anything I'm not. Right. Um, you know, I, 
I like the clients that I work with. We work with um, folks with very, very limited means, and we work with very affluent people. So you don't have a minimum requirement. I want no. I want to stop you there. Okay, so it's more of you guys really kind of want to help anyone wherever they are in life. Because where else are they going to go? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that's true. I think so often there's like when you meet with a financial advisor, they don't give you the attention unless right. you're at a certain net worth. And mm-hmm. so I think it's important for clients to know that your financial advisor at any net worth should be wanting to talk to you, meet with you, you know, update you on what's happening. And so I think that's an important point. I know I interrupted you, but I wanted to make sure to highlight that aspect of what you were saying. Right. Um, You know, a lot of what we do is financial literacy. We we close the gap. Um, Mm -hmm. They don't teach this in school. They should, uh, but they, they don't teach budgeting. They don't teach debt management, social security, when to collect social security. Everyone goes through it. You know, ideally, if you make it that long, but uh, applying for Medicare, every again, everyone who turns sixty-five, you know, needs to be thinking about Medicare. But uh, there's such a knowledge gap between the programs that are out there and the execution of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think, you know, one attribute that a, a client ought to be looking for is um, sort of a, a generalist approach, right? Mm-hmm. And by that I mean you have to know a little bit about everything. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I am not a day trader. If, if you're, uh, if clients out there are looking for someone who's, um, you know, going to be shorting stocks and things like that, that's, that's not what we do. That's, that's not what most people need either, frankly. Right. Um, right. most people need sort of chocolate, vanilla, strawberry, low cost. Um, mm-hmm. and, but also to be, be of counsel when those decision points come. So if, if you're meeting with someone and they don't know, that social security grows at uh, 8% per year from your full retirement age to 70, then you're kind of missing out on the true benefit of having someone on your side like that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. How often should a financial advisor be reaching out to meet with you? I like to talk to people quarterly. Um, Okay. And are you initiating that, Michael? Like you're initiating that connection? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we have a service schedule. For clients, okay. so you know the first quarter, you know usually the fourth quarter we do end of year tax planning, tax loss harvesting, things like that. Beginning of the year, we're, we're focused on um, beneficiary designations, estate planning, things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, the second quarter has a different focus. The third quarter has a different focus. But mm-hmm. I like to talk to people once a quarter at a minimum. But as needed in between too. There's no right. Uh, so if they need to pick up the phone and call you or have questions right. or concerns, they can do that. Right. And it doesn't affect that. We don't bill, you know, we're, we're, we're a little different than public accounting firms or, or even some, some attorneys, we don't bill by the hour. Right. So right. it's once we're in, we'll, you know, that's, that's a 24 seven obligation. Mm-hmm. So talk to me a little bit about how you guys do get paid. Mm-hmm. It's a fixed percentage of fees that uh, fixed percentage of the assets that we manage. Okay. Right. So the the rule general rule in the industry is about one percent, on mm-hmm. you know the of a million dollar account or you know, just using hypothetical numbers, um, we charge about 0.9 percent of that okay. roughly, um, yeah. and we take that divided by twelve, and that's our fee. Okay, well, so I will say that you know sometimes you have financial institutions or certain advisors that might get a certain percentage or commission if they sell you a certain product, and so it sounds like that's not necessarily what your fee structure is. is. It's just going to be a percentage of whatever it is. Correct. The, okay. the commission model again, it's up to the client's discretion, right. but we feel like ours is is less prone to any conflict of interest mm-hmm. um, and and no conflict of interest it's transparent right. and our, our interests are tied together right so if the mm-hmm. if the account goes down as it did earlier this year you yeah. know, we'll take a pay cut and mm-hmm. it's just we're in it together right absolutely so, so again you have a vested interest just like the really? client does absolutely. so again it's, it's like a partnership absolutely mm-hmm. yeah. um Talk to me a little bit about what age should someone be looking at a financial advisor? Because, you know, we meet with clients who are in their 
20s all the way up, you know, we have a client who's in their 90s. So at what age is a good time to say, hey, I really should find a financial planner? I'll tell you, I'll tell you who should after I tell you who does. Okay. Um, who does think of like a barbell? You have a group of young clients who are, I use the expression, they're first time adulting. Yeah. Um, they're starting to have kids. They start thinking about buying a house. They just kind of want, and which is beautiful. They just kind of want to get on a good track, right? Mm -hmm. And then we don't talk to them for a while or, or we stay with them. It doesn't matter. And then, and then the other end of the barbell, you have folks who are getting towards the end of their paycheck and they're going to make that transition to retirement or business succession or something like that. Right. And they have that panic moment. Um, and, and few and far between, I mean, of course you have people in their forties and fifties uh, reaching out, but that's, that's the sweet spot to, to meet someone mm -hmm. is before you get to that far end of the barbell. Um, right. Before you panic, before you have that now what kind of moment. Uh, right. It's in that, I would, I would, you know, call it sort of your prime years as a professional mm -hmm. in your 40s, 50s is, is probably the best time mm -hmm. to start uh, getting serious about it. Do you guys do things like talk about retirement projections, which is if you retire at such age, you know, you'll need X amount. Do you guys do those type of things with your clients? Extensively. Yeah, that's what I think is always very helpful, you know, because sometimes people may think I have enough and then they might talk to somebody like you and be like, oh, I really need more. I need to save more. I need to adjust kind of how I'm living now so that I'll have some money for retirement. So I always think those models where you guys can do that are so helpful to clients. Yeah, it's all about cash flows and goals. Yeah. What are your goals? And then yes. we need to sort of architect a cash flow, sustainable cash flow system to get there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so I met with a um, lady, probably been two weeks, and this is unusual for me. So I met with someone and they had a financial advisor and we're talking about it. And she said to me, I just don't care for him. I don't care for the financial advisor. So talk to me a little bit about how if somebody just doesn't feel comfortable, like we talked about finding someone that you trust, finding someone you feel competent, finding somebody who's willing to meet with you and answer your questions and be available. If we have a client that doesn't have an advisor, they feel like are meeting them where they need, how do you switch advisors? Uh, it's, it's a very simple process. And... It may be impolite, but legally, the outgoing advisor doesn't even need to be informed. Uh, it, and again, that's not polite, nor is it really professional, um, but it's it's a simple process of signing an agreement with the new advisor. Um, and, the, you know, there's a, the mechanically just transferring money over or, or what have you, and then we're off and running and the other okay. advisor, if the other advisor doesn't call and ask what happened, then mm -hmm. you've, you've made the right choice. Uh, clearly. Right. 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 So the question that I got from this lady is, well, if I switch advisors, am I going to have to talk to my old advisor? Like, am I going to have to call them and be like, I'm switching? No. And so what you're saying is no, technically that could be, for example, if you're the new advisor, you could handle all of that and wouldn't, yes the client wouldn't necessarily have to have any communication. Correct. Okay. Okay. I wanted to clarify that because the, the client was asking that and I understood where she was coming from. Like she didn't even want to have to deal with them. She didn't want to have to call and tell them that. So I think it's important for clients to know that if you do need to make a switch, you can do that. It's a lot like when you switch doctors, you don't have to go back to that doctor and say, exactly. Hey, I'm moving physicians. You go to the new physician and they request your chart from the old physician. And it's very similar when you're switching financial advisors. Correct. That's a great way to put it. Yeah. Okay. Good. I wanted to make sure that we covered that. So let's say that you get a new client. Maybe they came from an old advisor. Going forward, what should the relationship look like between client and advisor? My first, my first job is to figure out what the client's goals are mm -hmm. and then what the purpose of the money is, right? right. Money, money is just a tool. It's just a resource. Being the richest person in the graveyard 
doesn't really win anybody anything. Right. So I mean, if it's it's for if it's for the next generation, then that's even better. But um, I'm gonna the 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 tone of our conversation is usually gonna be goals, 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 cash flow, cash flow, cash flow, mm -hmm. um, and then any any changes. So it, we we do a lot of work up front, a lot of mm -hmm. work up front, as you would imagine, just like you do. You can't you can't get to know somebody's whole life story in a you know. 90 minute initial meeting, right? right? It, it, that takes a lot of time. Um, and, and getting to know all of their finances, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's like going for a, a full physical exam to use the, the medical analogy. Um, you, we're going to look at your heart, your lungs, your bowels, everything. And, um, that, that takes some time, but then once we have the plan built and structured, then, then it's sort of my job to, you know, be the, uh, the, the paddle board, just kind of keeping the ball in play and making sure that the client is, is still happy with the goals and the, and the strategy that we have to get there. In your bio, I was reading and I, you know, I know it was on the recording that you're considered an independent. Mm -hmm. Tell me what that means as it relates to other financial advisors. Right. So I don't, work for anyone else. I don't get okay. paid by anyone else. Okay. Um, I don't receive commissions. We, as, as a, as a matter of function, our, our client assets are what's called custodied. We have, we use custody at Charles Schwab and company, right? Okay. So you don't open an account with Mike Lynch investment planning. You open an account at Schwab and as part of that account opening process, you give us permission as independent third parties to go in and, and do what we need to do. Um, there's a lot of franchises that are out there who, you know, they're, they're independent franchise own. Um, but if, if you have to, I, I won't talk ill of uh, other franchisees, right. but uh, you ultimately answer to someone. And right. I answer to the client, to FINRA, and to the PA Department of Banking and Securities. So why choose to be independent as opposed to maybe affiliate? Does it give more option? Does it give more flexibility? What does that mean for you? There are pros and cons, um, and I'll be fully transparent about that. We don't have in-house judicial support. We don't have, I mean, that's, we don't have in-house CPAs. Um, but at the same time, I'm not uh, beholden to any particular quota or open so many new accounts. I mean, it's, it really gives the, the, the client sort of the, the, the least amount of conflict possible. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, this is something that when my, when my, my dad uh, broke away and started this firm back in 1990, nobody was really doing it this way. Um, right. it, it's just the, the independent model wasn't there yet. Mm -hmm. um, and and sort of as he and some of his peers have sort of come of age, it's really becoming the new fiduciary model of yeah. independent shop. When you're talking about being independent, and I want to make this point, it doesn't lessen the options that a client would have, right? As I opposed to would, like a franchisee. Oh, I think it would enhance them substantially. Okay. Because okay. I don't have to use, you know, to, to flip the previous example, I don't have to use some in-house estate planning attorney right. who's going to advise the client to leave the, uh, the, the assets to, in a beneficiary trust, oh, by the way, held at that custodian. Um, we can use the best of the best. Um, and right. I'm happy to do that. And we can use, you know, in terms of investment choices, anything that's out there. Mm -hmm. um, we're not beholden to any particular set of products or stocks or anything like that. Um, it, we feel that the flexibility uh, that comes without the overhead is, is uh, very freeing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Talk to me a little bit about, you've used a couple of times in the discussion, the word fiduciary. When mm -hmm. you're saying fiduciary, what are you meaning by that? I have to do things and make recommendations that are exclusively in the client's best interest. Okay. So again, it's all about client first is what we're yes. really saying with yeah. that fiduciary. Yeah. Right. I mentioned that because sometimes financial advisors that I'm talking to, they won't use the word fiduciary. 
And so I find that you're different in that sense that, you know, when I'm talking to you, whether it be on camera or off camera, that's something that is at the forefront of your mind is that you are a fiduciary for your clients, which I think is a nice approach because mm -hmm. for example, when I meet with clients, I have a fiduciary obligation Absolutely. as well. So to do what's in the best interest of the client. So meaning right. that, you know, and that being said, I may make different recommendations. I may say, well, you can do this. This option is less expensive. Here are the pros and the cons, or you can do this. And this is a little bit more expensive, but here's the benefit that you mm -hmm. get from that. So it doesn't mean that there aren't choices the client has, right. but every recommendation that I'm making, and it sounds like that you're making has to be in the best interest of the client, meaning that although I would benefit if maybe they chose a different, um, if I give two options, if they chose one option, my job is to set forth both options right. and for the client and the team that's advising them to make the best decision for them, mm -hmm. having nothing to do with like what I would get out of it as an attorney. Do you think that's a fair reflection of kind of what you are on the financial planning side of things? Yeah, I'm, I'm a bit envious because, you know, attorneys, members of the bar are fiduciaries. Yeah. And um, in, in my world, you can skirt around that in so many different ways. And even like I said earlier, I don't I forget if, if we were on recording or not, but, you know, the SEC can't really pin down what that means. Right. And yet you just have to come out and say you have to do things and, and advise things that are in the client's best interest. Um, informed informed decision making informed consent is important right. so if we do have a conflict or if if i do happen to open up an insurance practice as long as that's disclosed to the client that's that's fine you're you're still mm -hmm. meeting the fiduciary standard at that point um, but, but you have to disclose any conflict of interest or any any potential conflict of interest mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I just wanted to highlight that because like I said, not a lot of financial advisors refer to themselves in that role, you know, mm -hmm. talking about fiduciary. And I think that not that you have to, but I just like what it means for the client, which is it sure. has to be in their best interest. And so I think I, I wanted to highlight that. Um, yeah. My next question for you is that when we're talking about financial products, do you offer all kinds? Are there certain ones that you don't offer? Like, do you do insurance, annuities, all of those across the board? So no to insurance and no to annuities. Okay. Um, they're tool. Those are tools, mm -hmm. but we feel that they're the, um, the costs associated with them, the, the material, the financial cost and the, the lack of flexibility um, mm -hmm. is not always something that a client would need. Now, okay. in, in the case where they are appropriate, um, then again, we, we have the independent choice to find people who we really, really trust, people who have done my own insurance planning and, and our business plan. Right. Um, they're not going to mess with our clients. Because uh, right. that, now that's, that's the last time they work with one of our folks. So yes. Um, but again, it's 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 part of it, it's about being holistic, um, yeah. disclosing all information. Like we don't we don't get paid for referrals, nor do we pay for referrals. Um, right. So a client should feel comfortable if we're if we're giving a name to you know an, an attorney or an insurance agent that that it is someone who we truly trust and have a relationship with. Absolutely. Well, I do think that. Um... While some people might have insurance license and be able to do that, again, I feel like the setup that you have means that you're going to be finding the best professional to connect with and give you yeah. the best options. And again, it's not that, well, if I sell this annuity or I sell this insurance product, then I get money from it. Right. So, you know, if you're recommending it and it's going to someone that you know that does this, Again, I feel like it's a different, it comes from a different place because you have no stake in the game in the sense right. that you're not getting a referral fee for it. So if you're making the recommendation, you know, again, it goes back to that fiduciary obligation. You're doing what's in the best interest of the client. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we feel strongly about that. Yeah. All right. Let's turn to how it works with professionals. So meaning between like an attorney and a financial advisor and what that should look like. So what should the relationship be? And, 
you know, you can talk about it. We're going to talk about it and kind of what we both see, but what's, what should the relationship be between a client's financial advisor and their attorney? What should that look like? Different fingers on the same hand. Um, uh, the, as long as, as long as we have permission from the client to, you know, discuss freely with, with the attorney, um, we, we would expect to call them maybe once or twice a year, just to make sure the beneficiary designations on accounts are correct or, um, especially with business owners. I, I would say if you're a business owner, we're going to talk more frequently. Mm -hmm. I, like me as the advisor would talk more frequently with the attorney. Mm -hmm. um, just to sort of, again, even if the even if the client's not expecting a liquidation mm -hmm. event, just to be prepared for something. Absolutely. Um, and we're, we're constantly um, engaging with, with attorneys for uh, financial power of attorney, medical power of attorney, wills, uh, trusts, uh, special needs trusts, uh, mm -hmm. things like that. So, yeah, we 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 talk as needed, um, mm -hmm. but we both have a a firm understanding of of the client's circumstances. So, mm -hmm. I want the attorney to know if I have a client with a special needs child, um, I kind of want the attorney to know the full financial picture of that client's you know uh, set of circumstances, so that the the attorney can make the best product or the best. Uh, solution for that, for that yeah mm -hmm. well and i'm always shocked when clients come in because we have some clients that come in that have like documents drafted previously and maybe it's been 20 years and they need to update something but i always start off my discussion when we're talking about estate planning documents especially the will beneficiary designations because i don't know how an attorney can do an estate plan without consulting with the financial advisor about the beneficiaries because as you know anything with a designated beneficiary isn't going to go through the will so i can go to all the time trouble and expense come up with this very sophisticated will but if at the end of the day the majority of your assets have beneficiary designations then it's going to go to the designated beneficiaries. So awesome. I'm not sure how you can have a comprehensive estate plan without having the attorney communicating with the financial advisor on a regular basis about that estate plan. I'm just not sure I see a world in which that works unless they're communicating. And yeah, we've seen, we've seen that happen too. And it's like, look, you paid all this money, but none of it's going through probate. Like, you know, it's mm -hmm. what's the point if we're yeah. not rowing in the same direction. Absolutely. Um, and you Absolutely. can get really done at Staples or Legal Zoom. Yes. And those things scare me. Um, yes. So anytime I see something like that, I'm always like, all right, let's 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 get somebody involved here. Absolutely. And maybe I take a little bit different approach than some attorneys, but I am a big proponent of designate, designate, designate. You know, on anything you can designate, designate a beneficiary because there's so much more protection against creditors. And I know people are like, well, I don't have creditors, but it could be something like I was in a nursing home at the time of my death. And when I die, anything that goes through the probate estate is subject to what we call state recovery in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. So if we have a beneficiary designated, then we avoid that. You know, yeah. we avoid probate, we avoid all of that. The other thing that I think a lot of times maybe attorneys squawk at when it comes to beneficiary designations is they're always worried about liquidity in the estate. Well, if I designate, 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 especially with real estate, I may have real estate that's going through the will or the probate estate, and then I have non-probate assets, and how do I get the money from the non-probate to help pay taxes, upkeep, and expenses? And again, I don't think you have that problem if the attorney and the financial advisor are communicating in the way they should be communicating. Because right, all right. of those things are discussed. You know, mm -hmm. how are we going to do this? Even if it's something as simple as the beneficiaries know when they receive it, they may have to contribute a portion to the estate to pay the tax. Right. You know, talking through those things. So um, I guess my response when attorneys say, well, you know, I'm worried about liquidity issues. I just always feel like maybe that's an indication that there was a lack of communication between the financial advisor and the attorney. Yeah. So and sadly, that that happens more frequently than it ought to. Yes. And the other thing that I've seen lately, which I'm sure you've seen, and I wanted to talk to you about this, is the revocable living trust that attorneys do, and they usually are in those huge binders, and the attorney never funds the trust. 
Right. Have you seen those? I've seen one or two. Okay. Um, yeah, the typically that's that's not something that we we get down here. Um, right. Because we have wonderful estate planning attorneys like like yes. Delaware County is like a very rich right. county as far as yeah. estate planning attorneys. But you know, as with any type of specialty field, um, people are going to make mistakes and. Mm -hmm. Um, that's one of the things that my, my dad, uh, who was a former trust officer, um, gets oh, really, geez. uh, yeah, he gets really, really hot and bothered when he sees, when he sees things like that. Oh, I, it makes a mess. Like, so you have a client who yeah. in a lot of cases, um, so around here in where I am, so I'm in Franklin County, Adams County, right along there, there was okay. like this scam in the early 2000s where attorneys would actually go door to door or they might have like a dinner seminar have clients come and basically sell them the binder and then what they're doing is they're going back on a yearly basis and they're selling for lack of a better word maybe insurance or annuities and so um and when, as soon as I see a revocable trust if a client can't tell me why did they recommend this then we always have to start at the beginning and say, do we even need this? Right. And that's, there, there've been a few times um, in my experience here that I've, I've strongly considered filing something with the bar or filing something with the state insurance more, more frequently with the state insurance agents, uh, uh, the state insurance commissioner. Cause there are folks out there that, you know, if, Attorneys are fiduciaries, and um, if you're acting against that, I mean, it's we need to kind of check and balance on each other as mm -hmm. as professionals. And um, yeah, you can you can argue that at the time something made sense, um, but is it in their best interest? Is it suitable, right. or is it in their best interest? Right, um, and that's where sort of that that nuance comes. Well, and as we've seen, you know, since I've been practicing law. Um, which is a lot longer than I realized when I started counting up the years. But, um, you know, the law has changed so much. Yeah. You know, like we used to have a lower federal exemption, um, you know, a million dollars, and then it bumped to like 3.5, yeah. and then we had 5 million. So something that was done in the early 2000s may not be relevant. The reasons that you did that may no longer be there. And so when clients ask me, how often should I be meeting with the attorney? I always say, at minimum, you should be touching base yearly. You know, if you have questions throughout, you know, absolutely call. But you need to be making sure, and every attorney should be able to tell you, have there been any law changes during that year that would change your estate plan? We try to be proactive and we, we do try to send letters if there's like a sweeping change, like when yeah. the SECURE Act came in, just right. basically saying, here's the change, call us and we're happy to talk to you about yeah. the changes and whether they affect you. But I do think, and I'm speaking from the attorney profession, and then I'll ask you what you think about the financial advising profession. But I think as an attorney profession, we need to do better at educating our clients and providing resources that allow them to know what those changes are so that, you know, they don't, they don't walk out of my office and say, I don't know why we did it. You know, I don't need them to remember all of the specifics, mm -hmm. but I need them to know what they're doing accomplished their goals. You really struck a chord with the early 2000s. We have people who are still under this, this conviction that the estate tax exemption is $600,000. Yes. Not. And, and, you know, their, their questions are, I don't want to pay all these taxes or I don't mm -hmm. want my kids to pay all these, this, and that. well, your kids are only going to pay, what is it? Four and a half percent or something. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. it, you're, you're not going to pay the 40% federal tax. Um, so it's, it's surprising how people, I think it's, it's maybe their, their parents generation uh, who were subject to a 90% uh, right. federal estate tax, you know, and it, it's, it's this, this, this fear of the death tax and you had to sell the farm uh, especially mm -hmm. out in, in Adams and Franklin County, I'm, I'm sure there were cases where people have to sell the farm to pay taxes. Yeah, um, that's not the case anymore. And I, I think, you know, that's that's a, a huge opportunity for an attorney advisor relationship to sort of start there and say, 
you know, no, it's it's not six hundred thousand dollars anymore. But your your will is written as though it is, right? Yeah. So we need to fix that. Go see right. some animals. Yeah. Yes. And I think too, um, so early 2000s, when we had the lower exemption, you know, you had to do some bypass trust planning. Yep. Usually there were like A, B trust. And we did that because the exemption was lower, but also because husband and wife couldn't take each of their coupons and attach them to each mm -hmm. other unless we had the A, B trust planning. But what we have to know now is it may be more expensive to do AB trust planning in the sense that if we did a will back in the early 2000s to comply with what the law is and we never touch it again and we now have to administer it, we may have to be creating these separate trusts that we don't actually need right. under today's law. And so right. it ends up being more expensive administering an estate than it needs to be based on the law. And I am a huge proponent of you want to keep it as simple as we can, as long as it's accomplishing your goals. Right. So it's, it's not, it's not me trying to get you to spend money on an attorney. Right. It's me trying, you know, it's it's us collectively mm -hmm. trying to save heartburn for your heirs and cost for your heirs. Yeah. Um, you could die in test date too, and that's mm -hmm. fine, but you still have to go down to the courthouse and, um, you know, right. petition for, for administration. You know, that costs money and that's heartburn. Yeah. Um, so I think a little bit of, uh, you know, preparation ahead of time mm -hmm. leaves your heirs much better off. And I think we do, so I know I uh, rely a lot on medical examples, but you know, I go see my doctor yearly. I have like a wellness check, I think is what they call it. And I think that I always encourage my clients, there should be an estate planning wellness check that should be done every year. Even if it's just a phone call to say, you know, hey, I'm still good with what's in my documents. There's no law changes. I think we need to get out of the notion where it's once and done mm -hmm. because you know, your life changes. You could have kids that were younger when you initially did it that are now grown. So life changes, the law changes. And so it needs to be something that we're revisiting on a regular basis. And I think that that means that our model needs to line up more with sounds like what you guys have, which is meeting on a periodic basis to ensure that the goals are being met. Yeah. I, um, for, for estate planning documents, like I said, our we have a service schedule that happens to be the first quarter where we kind of touch on those things. Are we going to read everybody's will? Absolutely not. Right. Um, that's not my, that's right. not what I do. Um, but if they say, oh yeah, I think uh, my, my brother-in-law Sid wrote one back in the eighties. Well, that that's, that's where I say, all right, well, let's revisit this. And especially with healthcare powers of attorney too, mm -hmm. uh, because the, you know, HIPAA laws have changed so much. That's yeah. that's one that we really kind of harp on for medical mm -hmm. powers of attorney, living wills, um, yeah. even more so than financial powers of, of, of attorney. Mm -hmm. Well, I think too, I've noticed in the last three years, COVID has changed yeah. how healthcare power of attorneys are used mm -hmm. and living wills are used. Yeah. And so, you know, we now have discussions about that while mm -hmm. we're talking about those documents. So, you know, even if the law doesn't change, the circumstances may change mm -hmm. in how they're being applied. And okay. so talking about that and kind of knowing what to expect and what to look for and what should be in the documents is always something very important. And I agree because it then takes the pressure and emotion off the family when you're in that crisis, if you have those documents ahead of time, it can be very stressful in the midst of it. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I'm sure you've, I'm sure you've been, so, you know, privy to those, those types yeah. of events. And, um, you know, you, you kind of, at least in my experience, you kind of look like the bad guy with bringing yeah. bad news. And it's, it's really like, you know, we told you to get these things taken care of. And, you know, but you, of course you have to meet people where they are and just, be in the room. Um, I know. You're absolutely right. You do. But I just like to remind people and, and say, you know, check in, you know, check in with your advisors, yeah. check in with your attorney and just make sure that things are the way they should. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's turn to something a little bit more fun, which is what is the most rewarding part of your job as an advisor? When I get a child of a client say, mom loves you or dad loves you, can you help yeah. out? Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's always nice hearing from clients or or even clients sending their friends over as as referrals. 
But when it's a, I, I feel like you really, finance is such an intimate thing. Mm -hmm. We don't typically like to share that with, um, especially that for some reason, the, you know, certain generations don't like to disclose a lot of that. It's a very personal, intimate thing. Absolutely. But if, but if you feel comfortable enough with, with us to share that experience with your kids mm -hmm. and we can, we can work with the whole family across generations, that's awesome. That is great. The best referrals are client referrals, whether it be, you know, now somebody referring or even a child choosing to stay with you as a financial right. advisor. Absolutely. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So tell us any additional information that you would like us to know about you, about the practice that you guys have, mm -hmm. anything that you want to say in closing, Michael. I will say that, you know, while we are geographically separated, it's only a couple hours and we have, you know, we're, we're located here in Delaware County, PA, uh, but our clients are all across the state. We have clients across the country. We're, we're domiciled here in PA and uh, our regulator is, is Pennsylvania, but, um, you know, we certainly be more than willing to, to take a drive out to the beautiful, beautiful country yes, out there. come out to rural PA, yeah. Michael. <laughs> Did we talk about local honey? I no. Think we did. Oh, did okay. we? Uh, yeah. We might have because I have, there's a, you know, now that you say that, because yeah, I, we have some local honey around here. Right. I, so I used to live in Lancaster County and. Yes, uh, you're right. Thank yeah. you. Finish that thought. Yes. Yeah. We, uh, any, any excuse I can get to get some of those good natural, um, yeah. anti allergic, yeah, allergic things that I'm all about it. So. I like some good honey. We have some good honey here. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here today, Michael. I really appreciate it. So everybody, this is Michael Lynch. He's the certified financial planner and partner at Lynch Investment Planning. And he was this month's addition to partnering with the pros. And what we do is we will upload this to our YouTube channel and social media. Do you have any questions or concerns or comments? Um, of course, you can always reach out to our office at 717-655-2676. And Michael, why don't you go ahead and throw out your contact information as well so people can reach out to you if they have concerns. Sure. We, we can be best found via web search at lynchinvestmentplanning.com or lynchip.com. We have both okay. on there. So okay. you know, just Google us and you'll find us. What we're going to do is in the description of the video, we're going to go ahead and throw those links, drop them down in there so people can check you out. Okay. Yeah, um, thank you again so much. I really appreciate it. Um, this is Samantha Wolf with the law offices of Samantha Wolf. Thank you for tuning in to this edition of Partnering with the Pro.